Broadcasting from Singapore and broadcasting all around the world. You're listening to the EdTech Chat Podcast, taking the pulse of educators from all over the globe and bringing what you need every week. Now, over to your host, Craig Kemp. Hello and welcome to episode 19 of the EdTech Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Kemp, and I'm thrilled to have your support. As I've shared before, I continue to work with the incredibly talented Mark Quinn to improve the final audio quality of this podcast. He has his own podcast production studio that provides editing and mastering services to content creators. To connect with Mark, please see the details in the podcast notes below. Thank you for your questions that you continue to send in. This week, I wanted to discuss one question from Sanjay in India. He asked, what are your top edtech tools for high school students and why? Thank you for your question, Sanjay. In my line of work, I support teachers in all areas all over the globe. One of the areas that's always tricky to support is high school for numerous reasons. So being able to share some of my favorite high school tools is always fun. Here are my go-to edtech tools for high school learners. Number one, education perfect. I have not yet found a better built program that is more rounded for high school learners than Education Perfect. Not only does it support just about every high school subject, but it supports multiple curriculums and provides you with the opportunity to create your own content, all within an extremely engaging platform. On top of this, the data analytics are incredible. If you haven't tried it yet, sign up for a free look at bit.ly slash epvideos. The link is in the description below. Number two, Edpuzzle. Edpuzzle is a great way to create engaging experiences and resources for your learners. With more and more kids engaging in video content, it's a great way to engage high school students in learning. You can take videos from any platform such as YouTube and edit them to suit your needs, voice them over, and even add questions for students to respond to during the video. For more, visit edpuzzle.com. The link is in the description below. Number three, Hologo World. This may be new to you. Hologo is a new interactive AR app that's so well targeted for learners it's unbelievable. The library of resources consists of over 350 curated lessons across subjects such as sciences, maths, geography, and much more, and it's all available in 3D and augmented reality. Teachers who have successfully implemented Hologo based lessons throughout one academic year have seen an 87% improvement in the examination results of students. Curated by leading educators from all over the world and designed by world-class 3D animators, Hologo is the experience your learners need to thrive in this crazy world we live in. Stream short video lessons, access downloadable materials and short quizzes. Experience augmented reality lessons and games for education on your mobile app, plus much, much more. Connect now at hologo.world or request a direct link up via me. I'm happy to connect you for co-creation and partnership opportunities. The links are in the description below. Number four, Firefly Learning. Firefly is my learning management system and communications portal of choice, particularly for middle and high school learners. An engaging and constantly developing system that's grown in leaps and bounds in the last few years. Firefly is leading the way with new integrations, tools and support mechanisms to help you be more effective, support learning, connect to your community and use data to inform teaching and learning. They even have an extended free use offer for Australian schools available right now. Connect at fireflylearning.com or request a direct link up via me. I'm happy to connect you. The links are in the description below. I hope these four tools are useful to you Sanjay and maybe some are even new. I encourage you to invest some time signing up and exploring ways to use these tools to support learning in your classroom. If you have questions or just wanted to share your favorites, please do so via my social channels. A tool that has positively impacted the authentic and purposeful use of technology into classrooms and meeting rooms that I have worked in is Buncee. Buncee has been shared by some of my interviewees over the past few weeks as a must-have tool, so I thought I should feature it here now. Buncee is a creation and communications tool for students, educators, and administrators to create interactive content, allowing those of all ages to visualize concepts and communicate creatively. Buncee is an easy-to-use tool for your school's creation needs. I've seen it used so well by so many across various grades and subjects that it's so diverse for everyone's needs. I highly recommend that you take a look at Buncee by visiting buncee.com. The link is in the description below. Last week, we talked about blended learning. 
do make sure you go back, take a listen, and have a think about the way you incorporate blended learning in your school and your strategic plan for the future to support the development of technology integration and learning. Every week, I bring you a short interview with some of my edu heroes, an engaging learning experience with someone who makes a difference in education every day, with a particular focus or angle towards educational technology. This week, I had the pleasure of chatting with Mark Barnes and Daisy Krista Delu. Let's have a listen to the chats. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Mark Barnes. You might know him as at Mark Barnes 19 on Twitter with over 89,000 followers. Mark and I have been connected on Twitter for many years, and he has constantly been a source of inspiration for me. Mark is the founder of Times 10 Publications and the producer of the Hack Learning series, Lead Forward, and many other books that impact teachers, students, and leaders all over the world. Mark, it's an incredible pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk about education and technology integration? Hey, Craig, I appreciate you having me. I'm thrilled to be here and I am always ready to talk about education and ed tech. So let's do it. Let's go. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your current role and what inspires you to do what you do? Yeah, well, I'm a former classroom teacher. I taught for about 23 years uh, in a public school outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I taught junior high, I taught high school, multiple grades, English language arts, and uh, again, for about 23 years. And I, I left the classroom, uh, it's hard to believe, but it's about seven years ago now, but have remained in education since. I also did some teaching at the college level. And uh, I before I left the classroom, I wrote some books. I sort of shifted gears on how I teach. And, you know, after a decade, I, I changed everything, sort of rebuilt myself. And uh, and that led to a, a book I wrote for ASCD called Role Reversal. And, you know, I just sort of told that story. And um, I'm thankful that educators and school leaders got interested in that. And that ultimately led to me doing some speaking, showing up at some schools, talking about my journey. And, uh, you know, eventually that got me to where I am now, which is uh, founder and president of Times 10 Publications. So, you know, I just said, hey, I love this, bringing great content to educators. I want to keep doing it. And uh, that's what I do full time now. I work with some of the, the best innovative minds in the profession, and we bring great content to teachers and school leaders and hopefully make them better. That's amazing. And a recent tweet of yours really got me thinking about the current state of education. I mean, I read your tweets a lot and and connect with you and, and your thoughts all the time. But in this particular tweet, you brought out your inner Dr. Seuss and said, I will not grade you in a school. I will not grade you with a tool. I will not grade you on a test. I will not grade you, but I'll assess. I'll ask questions like why and how. You'll get feedback then and now. Forget about grades scribbled in red. We can talk and hack learning instead. I absolutely love this. With this in mind, Mark, what excites you about education today? Well, thanks for sharing that, Craig. Uh, you know, that was fun. I, I like poetry and uh, I, I don't write a lot of it, but I just dabble occasionally. We were going to do a hack learning chat on Twitter. You know, you talked about how you and I have connected so much over the years uh, and Twitter is a great place to do that. So we do a weekly Twitter chat live on Sunday mornings and um you know, we were talking about assessment that day and we were focusing on feedback. And, and this is something I'm passionate about. You know, you say, you know, what excites you? Well, assessment and feedback have always excited me. So I talked about that first book I wrote, Role Reversal, um, and my journey to change as a teacher. A big part of that change was me uh, completely eliminating traditional grades in my classroom. I just became so frustrated was seeing kids fail. And those failures were based on labels, you know, numbers, letters, things that don't really truly show the picture of what a learner can and can't do. So um, that was super exciting for me to completely change how I assess learning, to come to an understanding that assessment and grades are really different things. And uh, that was uh, huge for me. And this chat was all about that. So I thought, wow, what a fun way to get people talking and to make my point that I don't want to grade you. I don't want to label a learner. I want to just create a conversation about learning. So that's one of many things, uh, you know, technology, which we'll talk about, but I'm, I'm really big into 
assessment and de-emphasizing grades. Yeah, that story behind uh, that tweet, I, I really do enjoy that. Those sorts of stories uh, is what I'm all about when I connect and I engage with other educators online, those background stories that really make a difference for me. And Mark, in, in sort of this way of thinking, you give a lot of advice to educators online, to parents and to, to leaders in schools. What's your best advice for the educators that are listening today in relation to educational technology? Well, I think that uh, my, the most important and really a simple message is that you need to know that one size does not fit all when it comes to education technology. Uh, you know, a lot of um, schools and districts around the world now are using learning management systems. We've seen these grow in the past few years, and some really amazing tools have come out that allow teachers to put their their work in one place, to share documents, to create conversations about learning, and that's wonderful. And I know many kids who use these platforms and enjoy them, but we have to also know that people learn different ways and and they don't all love the same thing and kids especially you know they're so into the technology and we don't want to pigeonhole them with one tool so i'm not saying eliminate your learning management system it's probably a good one but we also need to help kids create a toolkit you know something that uh they have at their the ready you know, here's a tool that you could use for this. Here's a, a different tool that might help you in this way. And if we can create those opportunities and then be flexible enough as teachers to say, hey, you can use whichever tool you like. What I'm most interested in is that you show me what you know. And you've mentioned uh, professional learning networks a few times today already, Mark. And to me, that really emphasizes the importance you put on connecting and engaging with your PLN. Tell us a little bit more about your choice of professional learning networks. Where do you engage and who should we be connecting with? Yeah, well, you know, we, we talked about Twitter a little bit and, you know, I told the story about our chat and how, you know, I was able to sort of frame my feelings on a topic in, in a, you know, a cute little tweet. So I really love Twitter for that reason, you know, and you talked about connecting. I mean, you and I have connected on Twitter. I've connected with many marvelous educators on Twitter. In fact, you know, we have at times 10 now probably, well, I know we have more than 40 authors, you know, and, and that's, that's nothing in the grand scheme of things. We're very small, but 40 people who work in education who have contributed or written books for my company. And I would say that I have probably met 70% or more of those people on Twitter. I mean, I've had people who reached out to me on Twitter during a Twitter chat and said something that inspired me. And I looked at their profile and I see that they have a blog and I read their content and go, wow, this is someone who's got some great ideas. And ultimately, you know, that person winds up doing a book for us. So I think that's amazing. You know, Facebook is a great place to connect still. We have groups uh, that are connected to um, Times 10, that are connected to our books, to our authors, that have tens of thousands of people in them. Uh, you know, we've talked a great deal about my passion assessment. Uh, many years ago, I started a Twitter or a Facebook group called Teachers Throwing Out Grades when I got so excited about de emphasizing traditional grades. And I reached out to my friend Star Saxteen, who's written several books for Times 10. And I also loves to de-emphasize grades. And I said, hey, why don't you join me in this group and let's really get this conversation going. And, you know, that was years ago. And that group now has well over 10,000 people. And, you know, that's a pretty niche thing. You know, that's people talking all about assessment and feedback for learning. And, you know, there's people from dozens of countries around the world in there. So those, those two platforms, I would say, are my go-tos for creating and, and joining conversations about learning, but there are many others. And you've given us so many examples of your ability to continue to learn and grow in everything you do as an educator and now as a publisher and everything else that you seem to be able to fit into um, 24 hours a day, and I still can't figure out how you do it, <laughs> but it happens. Tell us about a book or a resource that you've been reading lately, or just one of your all-time favorites. Yeah, this one's really easy. Um, and, and you know, I did. I used to always answer this question by saying, oh my goodness, it's so hard to pick one book. But you know, last year, 
I read an age old book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Now, I, I would imagine many of your listeners have heard of this. Uh, it's 84 years old. So I know a lot of people, when I talk about this book, they go, people who have heard of it and never read it, they go, isn't that book really old? Isn't it outdated? And that's the beauty of it. As I say, it's absolutely not outdated. Uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People is about communication and empathy. And Dale Carnegie is truly someone uh, ahead of his time because uh, he explains in there how to create and nurture relationships, whether they're business. And, and it really started as a business book, but I think it's a tool for everyone. I've recommended it to so many friends in multiple professions. I tell teachers all the time when they say, what book should I read? I say, start with how to win friends and influence people and pass those lessons to your kids because it's all about understanding people, listening to their problems, trying to get uh, they're, where they're coming from more than where you're coming from. We as people, I think in general, tend to uh, default to argument or to our own point of view. And in this book, we learn how to understand everyone's point of view. And if we can get what other people feel and think and how they're motivated, and kids especially, boy, we can do so much for them. Uh, as teachers and adults. And if you're listening to this and wanting links to all of these, just look below in the show notes and there'll be a link to all of these things that Mark's spoken about. Mark, you've told us so much about everything else. I want to learn a little bit more about your books now and your publishing company in particular. What inspired you to write and why should we read your books or be engaged in the books that come out of your publishing company? Yeah, I really appreciate that question, Craig. And, you know, first of all, I've, I've been a writer most of my life. I started writing for the school newspaper back in high school a lifetime ago. And uh, and then I, I actually went on to uh, study journalism in college. And I wrote for a, a newspaper, a, not a high school paper, but a regular newspaper. I, I got to cover sports. I'm a huge sports fan. And I had what uh, a lot of people thought that was like the greatest job in the world. I got to go out and cover professional sports teams. And uh, but then, you know, I, I gravitated more to kids. I wanted to help kids. So I, I tried to combine those two, my love of writing and my love of helping kids. So, you know, I, I taught English language arts, worked all with, with kids on writing. But then, as I said earlier, uh, eventually I, I wanted to tell my story of how I changed as an educator. And I like to think, you know, over time became much better for kids. So that led to my first book and, um, you know, role reversal for ASCD, which we talked about earlier. And, you know, I, I wrote a few other books and then uh, I really loved that. I loved writing and I loved the idea of finding content. You know, I, I like to find contributors to my own books, people who are out there in the field doing the work and saying, hey, here's one of my ideas. Can you contribute in some way? And that led me to think, you know what, this is something that I think I can do. And of course, I had to learn how to be a publisher. So, you know, life, lifelong learners, right? You know, I had to really teach myself uh, with multiple resources how to do that. And then now it's, you know, I just go out and I find what I think are great projects. You know, I listen. That's another thing. Going back to that Dale Carnegie book, you know, it's so important to listen to people and to their needs. So the social channels we've talked about help with that. I, I'm constantly engaged with what other educators are talking about, and I'm, and I'm looking and seeing what's out there and saying, is there a need for this? And then I try and find those people. So at times 10, that's what we do. I, I think the thing I'm most proud of is I, when people ask me who we are, how are we different, I say, I feel like we have the best people. We've got the uh, teachers and school leaders who are in the field doing the work. And who are constantly working to better themselves. So, you know, we started out as the Hack Learning series. I co-authored Hacking Education with Jennifer Gonzalez. And it was all about solutions. I said, we need solutions to real problems in education. And we don't need a five-year plan. You know, a lot of education books are very heavy on research. And I said, I don't know that that's what I want to do. There's a place for those, for sure. But I said, I want to put something in teachers' hands that they can read in a night or two and say, you know what, I can take this to school tomorrow. 
And that's what hack learning is all about. We solve problems with what you can do tomorrow uh, ideas. And, and that's the, the crux of that series. And we recently launched the Lead Forward series. Uh, these are based on stories and strategies that great teachers and leaders tell. And, uh, you know, it's all about making educators better. So that's what I do full time now is I'm out there. I'm trying to find what the innovative minds in education are doing. And a lot of sometimes I'm just a recruiter, you know, I'm out there and I go to people and say, hey, I love what you're doing. And I'd love to, to use my amazing team and package it up and get it into the hands of more educators. And Mark, I can't advocate enough for the hacking education series and the hacking learning series, because that's one of the series of books that I constantly share with people all over the world and the work that I do. And I, I really do love it because it's easy to the point and it's, it's something that someone can pick up if you're a listener right now, something you can pick up and just go for um, to really help solve those problems that you have every day. Mark, you've just shared so much amazing stuff with us that I know our listeners are going to want to connect and follow you. How do they do that? Yeah, I really appreciate the conversation, Craig. It, it, it's it's so exciting to speak to you and uh, and share these things with people and, again, continue to hope to make educators better. I'd love to continue the conversation. People can find me on Twitter. I'm at Mark Barnes 19. That's Mark Barnes number one nine. And, uh, you know, they can learn all about us on our website, which is 10publications.com. That's the number 10publications.com. There's a uh, contacts there. Our team page has all of our authors in one place, a little bit about them, how to connect with them too. And that's what I'd really encourage your listeners to do. Uh, I'm always available to talk on Twitter, but, you know, connect with our authors because they're really the brilliant minds behind what we do. Thank you for everything, Mark. And thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, Craig. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Daisy Christodoulou. You might know her as at Daisy Christo with over 42,000 followers on Twitter. Daisy is the Director of Education at No More Marking and is the author of Seven Myths About Education, Making Good Progress, and Teachers vs. Tech. Daisy, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk about education and technology integration? Yes, absolutely. Looking forward to it, Craig. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's go. Why don't you start by describing your current role and what inspires you to do what you do? So I am the Director of Education at No More Marking. And at No More Marking, we provide online comparative judgment assessments. And what inspires me about that is comparative judgment is a really uh, innovative new way of assessing open-ended questions like essays, uh, any kind of open question. And the reason that, that I'm inspired to do it is because I really want assessment to be used as a force for good and for it to be seen not as something that is kind of done to schools or done to students, but as something that uh, schools and teachers and pupils can be a part of, that they can see how it works uh, and they can see the value of it. So comparative judgment, as I say, it lets you assess tasks that are normally quite hard to assess. Uh, like, like I said, like essays, open-ended tasks. Um, so in that sense, it can help to make assessment more valid, uh, help to improve teaching and learning, to improve the impact it has on teaching and learning. Uh, it's much more reliable than traditional methods of assessment and, and much more efficient too, so it saves teachers time. So uh, that's, uh, that's a, 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 a thing that really inspires me to, to want to do what I do. I love uh, talking to people about assessment because it's something that really gets me going as well. It's quite sad to say, but I really enjoy it. And I really enjoy talking about the nitty gritty when it comes to what does assessment look like. And when we talk about, Daisy, the bigger picture of education today, what excites you about education? So what excites me is, uh, I think, bringing learning science into schools and into the classroom. And so that includes, for me, comparative judgment as part of that. So some of the, the science and the research around assessment and how we can do assessment better, what it can do, what it can't do. But also more broadly than that, uh, all of the sciences uh, around learning that we're developing so many areas and that are having an impact on so many parts of life. So things to do with working memory, um, long term memory, uh, how we solve problems, how we think, how we remember the, the, the value of memory, all these kinds of things. There's enormous amounts of research out there. And I think when I trained to teach, uh, I, I didn't feel like enough of those were having an impact on the classroom. But I think over the last five to 10 years, we've seen more and more of that research filter into the classroom. And I think that that's really exciting. 
And I think uh, for that reason, it's a really exciting time to be in education. I couldn't agree more. And your experience around educational technology in particular, I'm quite keen to pick your brains on. What's your best advice for educators in relation to edtech? So my best advice would be, what is the problem you want to solve? So don't start with a solution, start with a problem. Um, and because I see, where I see edtech go wrong the most is when people, when they kind of start with a, a shiny piece of hardware or they start with the, the you know, you know a, a cool piece of tech and they're not really thinking about, well, what is the problem I want it to solve? So don't just throw hardware at the problem. Uh, don't just go for like the latest, whatever the latest sort of cutting edge technology is. Think what's the problem that we've got here? What's the issue that we've got? And, and how can we solve that? And then how can technology help us to solve that problem? Um, I think that's where it, 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 it works best. And certainly I'd say my own experience with comparative judgment. I came to comparative judgment because as an English teacher, I was really frustrated with the traditional method of marking essays. And I was searching around for, for better rubrics and for better ways to assess essays. And then came across comparative judgment, which was a completely different way of assessing essays but it was solving that problem. So that's that's where I think the, the key is. Search for the, uh, look for the problem, not the solution. That's some music to my ears. It's something that I talk about all the time. So it's really nice when I hear other people preach that as well. What about professional learning networks? Where do you choose to engage and who should you be meeting with? So um, I really like in the, in the, the U, there's a UK group, Research Ed, um, and they've kind of gone global now and they do conferences or, in lots of parts of the world and they do lots of online offers as well. Um, so I, I really like research ed and I think they're very much all about bringing that, bringing that, um, research into the classroom and being that bridge between, between research and, and, and schools. And I also must say, yeah, I, I get a lot from Twitter and I think there's a, a, a really lively, um, Twitter education community and I, and I very much enjoy engaging with that. And I think, um, it's a really nice way for people from all over the world, you know, breaking down the distances, all of people from all over the world, being able to, to share best practice and learn from each other. And we've spoken about already about the importance of the why and, and really identifying your problem. But what's an ed tech tool that you're using right now in your day to day work that you think others should be looking at and using as well? So one I'm really kind of a little bit obsessed with at the minute is a flashcard app called Anki. Um, so there's lots of different flashcard apps out there. Uh, Anki, I quite like. Um, but the problem it's solving for me and the reason why I like it so much is it's solving the problem that it's so easy to forget things that you read and to forget things that you learn. Um, so for me in particular, I love reading. I read a lot of books, but I find as time goes on, I have these books on my shelves or on my Kindle that uh, I know I read and I remember reading them, but I don't remember as much of the detail of them as I'd like. And that's really frustrating. The most frustrating experience is when um, you, you realise you read something maybe five or six years ago that had an idea in it that would really help you now with a problem you're facing and you'd forgotten about it. Um, and, and so I just think if you can hold on to and remember the ideas that you read about and learn about, uh, it gives you so many different tools to be able to tackle the problems you face in life. And so what Anki does is you add your flashcards into it and it kind of serves them up to you on a, on a, on a schedule that's based on spaced repetition. So um, you don't review every flashcard every day. You, if you review it successfully, it gets postponed. You know, you don't see it again for a, a couple of days and then a week and then a couple of weeks and then a month and then a couple of months and so on and so forth. So the more times you get it right, you don't see it as often. If you get it wrong, it kind of comes back to the beginning again. So it's, uh, and it's, it's based on this idea of space repetition. It's based on the idea as well that um, the act of recalling something from, from memory helps to build the memory. And I find it incredibly effective and incredibly efficient. So I never normally have to be looking daily at more than a couple of percent of the, the flashcards I have. But doing that means I can kind of remember all of them. So I, I find it really powerful. Um, and yeah, I, I just think it's a, it's a really nice way to, to, to just remember big ideas and remember things that you've read and, 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 and not have that horrible experience of uh, coming across something that you've, you've, you've read years ago that would have been really useful to you. What a cool resource. And the link to that is in the description below. Learning is important to all of us, Daisy, and educators, that's all too common. Why don't you recommend a book or a resource that you've been reading lately or just one of your all-time favorites and tell us why we should be exploring it? Okay, so I'll be greedy. I'll say two. One of my all-time favorites is Professor Daniel Willingham, uh, Why Don't Students Like School? I love that book and come back to it again and again. It's all about how we learn. Um, a newer one that I've found really interesting and isn't necessarily uh, directly about education but I think has really interesting implications for education is a book by uh, Timothy Wu called The Attention Merchants um, and it's all about a history of attention 
and a history of how industries have tried to kind of really steal our attention or grab our attention. And I find it really interesting because the, the implication it has for education is attention is the currency of learning. And if our attention is uh, being is under threat and is, 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 is all these things, you know, all these modern applications and, 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 and really a large part of the Internet is really an attention economy. So if your attention is always under threat and always being sought after and it's uh, being chased off by advertisers all the time, what does that mean for education? And I do think it is a, a worry that so many of the business models of the biggest, uh, the biggest companies in the world are based on an advertising model that's based on, on grabbing your attention. I think that has big implications for education, which we're only really starting to grapple with. And on top of everything you do, Daisy, you're actually also a published author yourself. Tell us about your books and what inspired you to write them. So I've written three books. Uh, the first one, Seven Myths About Education. Um, it's all about, it's, it's what I've been talking about, it's about the, an application, if you like, of, 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 of research and cognitive science to classroom practice. And the reason I called it Seven Myths About Education is a lot of the research I was reading was contradicting the advice I was getting about how to teach. So the thing that motivated me to write that was just, yeah, trying to uh, say what's going on here. How come we have this uh, supposed best practice about teaching that doesn't actually line up with the science? So, so the seven myths of the title were seven really big key ideas where I felt the research was, was diverging from, from what was being recommended as best practice. And my second book's about assessment, making good progress. So it's all about, um, I guess, yeah, more, more things about assessment and the research and particularly about formative and summative assessment, kind of what's the best way of doing those. And finally, just uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I published Teachers versus Tech, which is all about education technology. And again, what the research says about technology, how we can use it effectively in the classroom, um, why it maybe hasn't had necessarily the transformative impact that it, uh, that we might have hoped for in the past. So I look at, I do look at ways in which technology has gone wrong in the past, but I'm, I'm pretty hopeful. And in particular, I've talked about comparative judgment and space repetition flashcard systems. There, there are things out there that I think you just cannot do without technology and that when you get them up and running and working for you, they are incredibly powerful and they really do uh, repay the kind of effort effort to work with them. So uh, even though they've, I, I do highlight the, the issues of technology, I am I'm really, you know, a, a fan of, of, of where it's working well, and I think it does things you just can't do in other ways. Thanks, Daisy. And what's the best way for the listeners to follow and connect with you to learn a little bit more about what you do and also to find your books? So I'm on Twitter, and my Twitter handle, as you said at the start, is at Daisy Christo. So you can definitely follow me there and tweet quite a bit. And I've also got a blog, daisychristodulu.com. So follow me on Twitter, follow the blog. Uh, there's plenty there for you, to, to, for you to start with. And those links are below in the description of the podcast notes. Daisy, thank you so much for your time. That's great. Thank you, Craig. Next week, join me for episode 20 of the EdTech Chat podcast when I'm joined by Kristen Zemke and Mark Enser. One of the things I love doing is giving away prizes as a thank you for tuning in, listening, and hopefully subscribing to the EdTech Chat podcast. Last week, Education Perfect gave away a $250 subscription to their game-changing product. To win, you needed to complete the form at bit.ly slash edtechwin. The winner has already been contacted directly by me, and it is Peter Whitfield. Congratulations, Peter. This week, I'm giving away a Bebot robot from TTS, an amazing addition to your computer science program, especially if you teach two to seven-year-olds. To win the Bebot, you need to go to bit.ly slash edtechwin and complete the simple form. It'll take you less than a minute to complete. The link is in the description below. Competition closes on Wednesday the 16th of September and the winner will be contacted directly by me and announced on next Friday's episode. Good luck. If you enjoyed today's episode, please smash that subscribe button and share it with your colleagues, friends and families. I appreciate your support. Please remember to spend two minutes to rate the podcast too, so we can reach even more educators and edtech enthusiasts globally. Please share your favorite part of today's episode by tagging me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And please don't hesitate to ask me questions that I can answer in an upcoming episode. Remember, you have the chance to win as well. Check out the links in the description for more. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to the EdTech Chat Podcast. Creating a community for educators to learn, share, and grow. If you like today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss another episode. 
and be in the drawing to win prizes every week. If you know others that would enjoy the show, please hit that share button and brighten their day. Join us again next week for your weekly EdTech hit with at Mr. Kemp NZ. We'll see you again soon.